Afternoon everyone, we're back here, or afternoon if you're in the UK of course. We're back here um, and we are making our lovely carousel today, our Christmas carousel. We've got Finn behind the camera today, his turn. He's uh, he's put himself forward to do our camera work and ask questions. And um, so this is one of our series, this is a two part of this one. We started this carousel uh, on Tuesday and we've made so far the feet the candle holder, the base, the little scene holder, um, and the, the centre spindle there. So we've still got loads and loads of things to do. We've got the spindles on either side. We've got the, the actual arch to do here. The hub, which is going to involve using the indexing facility on the lathe. Um, hu uh, blade holders and blades themselves. So a huge amount of work to do. Um, I, I did have a conversation with you on Tuesday about not getting too intimidated by a project like this because once broken down each piece is really really simple. For instance, I've got some made up here. The centre columns that we're going to, sorry, the side pillars we're going to start with are tiny and they're only, you only need to make two of those reasonably similar, don't have to be identical but as close as you can get. Um, and the same with everything else, it's just just repeating the same thing. So simple pieces put together to make one lovely finished heirloom really. Every time you take that out at Christmas time you can think about our um, our meetings on a Tuesday and a Thursday. Hopefully we'll still be going by then with them. Um, next week we've got another Christmas heirloom uh, uh, creation for you. So we look forward next week to Angels of Light and Miners of Light. Look them up on the internet you'll see exactly what they're all about. And they're gonna, um, their origins come from the same part of Germany, the Erzberg Mountains or Erzberg area, all mountains um, around that, the areas of Obenhau and, and Siefen. So uh, do your research, have a look. You'll see what I mean when, uh, when you have a look online, uh, what wonderful places they are. But today we're gonna concentrate on the Christmas pyramid, a single tier Christmas pyramid. Like I said to you on Tuesday, go and get the Woodturning magazine if you can get your hands on it. That has a three tiered um, version of what we're about to do today. Um, so I thought we'd keep it simple, your first one, you know. Um, so we're going to start with the easy bits here, the centre or the side columns, and then we'll move on up. So we're just going to move it out of the way for the minute. We're going to refer to this fairly frequently. Just put my coffee where I was about to put the pyramid, so we'll get that one out of the way. I've been busy, been busy preparing for next week, preparing for our angels of light and things like that. A um, little bit of warm up, so I've got a few little practice pieces here that I like to warm up with. If ever I've demonstrated for you as a club or um, for a remote demonstration, then you'll see me do these sorts of things. This is a little lace bobbin, this is a Midland bobbin. Um, and I'll turn a few of those every now and again because the ladies that make lace still need the bobbins being made. These are, uh, this is a bit of bubinga this one, but this one's a Midland lace bobbin. I've got Honnet and lace bobbins to do. But just a little bit of warm up. We all need warm ups, and even when it comes to wood turning, you need to limber up the fingers and get used to the skew and practice things like that. And that's exactly what we're going to do today. You think about starting off on our first project, a little tiny piece of turning like that, you're going to practice the skew or we'll use the skew a lot on that sort of thing. So that's where we're aiming. Okay, we're going to get the sanding table out of the way just for the moment. We will come back to that. Um, but we're going to start with our columns. So I've got a couple of pieces of oak here, both the same length, obviously. Uh, we're going to create a couple of tenons, one on each end. We need one to go into the base and one to go into what will be the arch over the top. So they're going to be the same. They're 8mm mil, um, eight mil, uh, tenons on there. And the overall length of that one, remember you're going to get your pen and paper out now and start writing down figures. The overall length of that one is a... 115 mil, almost four and a quarter inches. Um, we've just got a quick question straight off the bat. Um, this one's saying, um, can you recommend the optimum working height for a lathe? The, the general rule is elbow height to centre height, but I like my lathes a little bit higher than that, probably around about 50 mil, about two inches higher than that again. Um, otherwise, you tend to be stooping down. Um, if you're finding yourself doing this, um, then you need to get that lathe up a little bit. The other thing is if you're using a bench top lathe on a conventional workbench, the likelihood is your, your bench, um, your lathe is going to be too high for you as well. So you might need to elevate yourself a little stage, build a pallet stage or something like that. Um, just remember you're stood on it, don't fall off the thing. Um, but yeah, so rough guide, elbow height to centre height. So we're going to use uh, ring centre 
in the tail stock end. And it's important now we're going to use a single pointed center in the, sorry, ring center in the headstock end, single pointed center in the tail stock end. Really, really important that. Um, we'll show you why in a minute. Finn, if you want to get the camera over now, we get right on the action. You can move the dust extractor, buddy. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna really use that. So get it right out of the way. And the stand, if you want. I'm not gonna sand anything for you today. You know, you don't need me to demonstrate sanding for you. So. My tool rest, I want a nice small tool rest. We've got the robust tool rest here. So lovely little, little tool rest that I can get right in there with. The 150 mil tool rest. And look, we've got tenon here. Is that is that all right? Is that too light there, Finn? Or no, that's all right. That's okay. I'm going to move that stand right out of the way just to give you loads of room. That's it. That's Everyone's it. saying the quality is good today as well. Hey, look at that. Bonus. We are... Cooking today, good stuff, right. There we are, we're going rapid today. We're around about 2,000, 2,300, that sort of speed. We're gonna start by roughing down with a, um, a, a small bowl gouge of six mil, so a quarter inch. And these are friction drives, don't worry if you get, get them stop a couple of times, just give the tail stop a tweak and it'll tighten back up again. There we are, just a touch with the bowl gals. Now I'm gonna go over to our, you know what's coming, we're going over to the skew. I'm concentrating on the tenons first, because then I know what timber I've got between them. Um, Gerald was just asking, by any chance do you remember what edition the plans were in uh, in the wood turning magazines for this project? Two years ago is, is what I remember. I was talking to a club last night, the Gloucester Wood Turners, and they had the magazine in front of me. Uh, and no, but Lily, make a note of that question. And we'll post it. I'll um, I'll get it. I'll find the the um, the copy and I'll post it on Facebook for you. So Lily, you make a note of that one for me. That'd be grand. Uh, I got a question from Ian Britt. He's just asking what height should the tool rest be? Tool rest for this, it, because we're working on such a small amount, a small diameter of timber. I'm not adjusting the tool rest too much. So here I'm roughly below centre by about a mil. Um, if I was doing a bigger piece of timber, I'd have the tool rest high for the skew and I'd have it low for the gouge. Here, I'm keeping it in one place and not moving it too much. So if you had anything from centre point to a millimetre below would be fine. You then just raise your elbow, raise the handle to suit the size. Now, I'm putting a tenon on both sides, but at the moment, that's too big for a tenon. So I'm going to do that side and then flip it and do the other side. So we'll go with a small quarter inch beading and passing tool. Quarter inch roughly translates to six mil. It's a little bit bigger than six mil, but roughly. Now I'm gonna flip it. And that fits neatly inside the ring of that ring center. So we can now do the other tenon. Conveniently inside. Um, Keith Garden was just asking if you got his email with his address. I did get that. I'm gonna to reply to all the emails um, later on tonight, Keith. Um, yeah, got your address, got all the bits and bobs there, so we'll get that sorted over the weekend for you. There we are, two 8mm tenons. Now, I did. I was a bit blasé with that, I didn't care too much um, about where or the length of them, doesn't matter, because it only matters on the second one. The first one can be whatever you want it to be. Um, within reason. The second one has to has to meet <coughs> the same requirements. So, so now we're going to do some shaping. So let's have a fillet on one side and we'll have a fillet on the other. Do you know uh, when the robust tool rests and the signet skews are going to be back in stock? So the robust tool rests have just, we've just had another order placed. 
last week. Signature SKUs are on order, um, but at the moment they're being made. So I don't have a clear ETA for those. Um, I know that they are are in um, are on order, but I don't know how long they're going to take to get here. So um, to answer both your questions, there no, not really. I'm hoping soon. Uh, so beads, beads on both ends. I'm just keep looking behind me for the one I've got done already, really. So we'll roll some beads. So heel of the skew, just round them over. Same on the other side. And then a half bead on this side. Uh, Lily, maybe you want to have a, make a note of those two uh, queries about stock and, and see if we can find out a little bit more. Now, a little bit of spindle gouge work. I've just lowered the tool rest there now because I want to get the spindle gouge below centre. Now we'll just blend into that curve. Um, Ian was just asking, do you wear eye protection? Yeah, I've got eye protection on just up to myself. At the moment I've got my work specs on because it's a small piece that, uh, that I'm turning. If it's a big piece, then I will use Grab it, sat on the bench. So any of the big stuff, then I've got eye protection, I've got dust protection, and a lot of the time on my own in here, I wear my ear protection as well. It's one thing that as wood turners we sort of neglect as our ears, but you're making a huge amount of racket a lot of the time, um, so it's quite important. You can put your earphones on underneath if you want to listen to the music, but it's quite important just to protect yourself. So a little bit of ACDC, really, really loud. Of course, it's going to protect your ears nicely. Um, Alex is just wondering what type of skew you're using. Everyone's going to have a big sigh now. It's, of course, it's the Colway Signature Skew. <laughs> German style, German influenced skew shape. They're so good, Alex. You just can't get them at the moment. <laughs> oh, there you go. Graham's uh, answered the question about the issue. It's issue 350 of the Wood Turning Magazine. Oh, thank you, Graham. Well done. There we are. So we need to make another one of those now. Oh, we've got to sand it first. I'm not sanding, like I said for you, but we're going to make another one of those. And these are the little side columns that support the arch, like I said. Now let's just very quickly do a quick copy. Um, this bit of gnarly old oak, quite nice looking stuff. Great opportunity to use all the scraps in the workshop and uh, you've seen on this project so far we used oak, we've used sapili, all this bit's cracked. I'll grab another bit though. The big split running through there, look. So we'll need another bit of that. Um, yeah, so using up all the scraps is a good good opportunity to do that. Well, I've got another piece of oak, he says. Oh, there you go. Good opportunity to do that. Um, uh, yeah, just to rob the bit, bit bin, or the firewood bin. There we are, I'll do another one of those. How far am I in, Finn, time-wise? Just coming up, just got over a quarter of an hour. Oh, okay. <laughs> In that case, we'll crack on nice and quickly.
drop it down, create our tenons. Remember, that's going to be 8 mil. So on this side, I'm just going to do whatever size down to 8 mil. We're then going to swap them around just so we can get access to the other side. Now going to mark. I'm just going to make sure that I'm not um, any... There we are, that's the length. I want, doesn't matter what the tenon size are, but what's in between the tenons is voisel, otherwise you'll have a lopsided arch. making a carousel that had lots of columns so something like the three tier version I've made um, then you'll need to start measuring properly. For the moment though I'm just going to pencil mark everything. That's going to be ample for us. Uh, we've got a comment here from James Pritchard who's just saying are the signature skews still forged uh, and some people are having a few problems with uh, the rolled corners. With the rolled corners. With these rolled corners, I'm guessing you mean? I believe so, maybe. Because that was my request to make them run easier on the tool rest and, and be able to rotate for bead forming easier. Um, and the other one, they're not, hand, well, they're high speed still. They're not beaten with a hammer, they are cut and shaped. And then they're cryo treated. Another bead this side. Do that fine neck down with the tool rest. Now this is my design, you don't have to stick with this, you can do whatever you would like. As long as you get two reasonably similar, that'll do. And then again, like I said, you would need to sand that. A little bit more off of here, but there you go, you get the idea. We've got a couple of, couple of columns to stand our arch on. Okay, so moving on, okay Finn, up to me. Let's have a look, we've got a few bits of kit to look at now. Because we're going to work on an arch. So as a wood turner, a little bit out of my comfort zone now, we're going to start looking at uh, some sanding drums. So let's take a few bits of kit away. Get the tailstock out of the way just for a minute. So the arch is our next thing. That's going to support and, and tie everything together. Okay, so it's this arch here. Um, obviously not turned, um, but we'll look at how we make that one. It's nice and simple. Again, like I said, you know, I'm a, I'm a wood turner foremost, a uh, woodworker secondly. Um, my skills are, aren't bad, but they're not cabinet maker skills by any means. When I started making these, I used to try and conserve wood and, and uh, get as much in one piece as possible. So you can see what I'm doing there, trying to mark out and feel that bit of timber. That made things difficult for, for drilling them. Didn't make it life easier for me. So what I now do is have the square um, or, or rectangle already cut. And on that, I've put a center line 
on that centre line, I can then drill. So this is a four mil hole that I've drilled in this side. When the arch is cut, that goes all the way through the arch. So that's going to be the support for the centre pin that runs all the way up through and then houses the impeller at the top. If you look underneath there, I've got the eight mil holes that are going to support or be supported by the columns we've just turned. Okay, so with it that shape, I can put that in my pillar drill, hold it nice and firmly, and everything's everything's nice upright and, and easy to hold. From there on, having that centre line, I can now use another one of my templates. And instead of cutting a template out that's the whole shape. I've just done half because I found that just doing half and just li literally just scribing out one side and then mirroring over and doing that, I find I can get it the same more often. Um, where if you try and sort of recreate one whole column, you, you tend to get one side slightly different from the other side. So that for me is much easier. Scribe it out, cut it out on the bound saw or the scroll saw or even by hand on a coping saw and you'll, you'll have your rough finish. Again, I'm a little bit plainer in the in the arch now. You can see now the line comes down and off straight, whereas my old ones are more Chinese style um, and they veer up at the ends here. Um, I want to get rid of that. I don't like that. It makes things harder for sanding um, afterwards. All the convex curves on the, the arch, all the convex curves on the arch, like these, and like the outside runs, they can be done with your sanding table and your, your sanding disc. But we have a solution when it comes to um, all the concave ones, we're going to use a drum instead. So I've got a couple of options for you, two different price bands. Uh, my favourite, unfortunately my favourite is the most expensive, but that's like, you know, you, you know you're going to find that in, in many things. Um, I'm going to get my old chuck working. My old engineering chuck. We've discussed many options though with this chuck, so if you don't want to use this one because you're worried about your fingers, absolutely. Safety first. Uh, just a quick question from Eric. He was just saying um, he's got a his parting tool. He said the edge on it isn't square. Have you got any ideas how we can fix that? It isn't square. No. So. Well, I mean, I would just square it back up on the on the grinder or the sharpening system. That, that's the only way. Um, basically, what's happened, uh, one of the faces, you've just just sharpened at a very slight angle, so that's put the face out as well. Um, so, yeah, back to the grinder. Um, I mean, it's not massively important um, unless you're sizing with it. Then, then obviously, it's going to make a big difference. Um, so, yeah, that would be the only thing. Back to the grinder, I'm afraid, or sharpening system. Uh, another one here from Nicholas. He was just saying, have you got any idea where he can get a copy of the Word Turning magazine? Go to back issue. So go to GMC. Go to the GMC website um, or Wood Turning magazine website. Um, DM, uh, GMC is a publisher. Um, go to Wood Turning magazine, and then you'll see all the back issues. Whether they go far as back as that, I'm not sure. Um, but it, inquire. You know, you, you'll see back issues tab there. Uh, just another one here from uh, Keith. He was just saying, uh, what is the size of the wood for the arch? For the arch. The arch um, so this piece here, um, I've got, uh, I can measure that. That's uh, 155, just over six inches long. And then, uh, so 70 mil wide, just, just under two and three quarters. And then thickness I've got here at, it's about 15 mil. About 15 mil. Solution. So let's just have a look at these drum sanders. Lily has the part numbers for these. I've already primed her on this one. This is the first one, and by by far for me the best one. You can see the different sizes of drums down to the. There's a little wee one in there somewhere. There. Yeah, there. Um, little tightening tool there, but you get four decent sized drums with sanding strip. Okay, so it's not a drum that you put on there, it's actually a sanding strip. And I find that easier because you don't have to buy expensive um, sleeves to go on to those drums. We're going to use one of those in a minute. A cheaper version, okay, are these. You can get these from Axminster, so you can get them pretty much anywhere. Um, they are, they're a lot cheaper to initially buy. The only thing I would say, once you've got these, you then have to buy the little drums to go on them. 
So that's the only downside with those. But there are five or six different sizes in those. And then the way we're going to use those is to basically to sand all the internal curves. You can hold them on a pillar drill, absolutely fine, and then sand using your pillar drill. Or if you're doing what I'm doing here, let's take one of the drums, my lovely little precision chuck. I'm going to hold that. They have a little <coughs> centre hole. Not sure whether you can pick that centre hole up. Not, uh, not quite. There is. A little bit. Take my word for it. There is a centre hole there. That centre hole can be used with your single pointed tailstock centre. And again, with we won't do too much because we haven't got the extractor uh, lined up. I've got another one here from um, Eric. Yep. He was just saying, what's your opinion regarding the Crown HSS and powder metal tools? Um, PM tools, absolutely fine. Um, high speed steels, absolutely. That's, you know, we started off back, I don't know, 30 years ago in, with high speed steel. I, I guess we, well, I started off with um, uh, carbon steel tools. In fact, one of my favorite SKUs here is still carbon steel. Um, no issues with them. Um, they just need to be sharpened more often. Then high speed steel come along. That's fantastic. High speed steel will stay sharper for longer. They just don't stay, they, you just can't get as sharp an edge as you can on carbon steel. PM source of palimatology, um, cryo tree, this is just another way to make the steel harder again. That's all. They all they're all brilliant, they're all lovely. I would say the more important thing to consider is shape of things like flutes. Um, you know, things like your skew chisel, have they got sharp edges on the corners when they when you round over it, all those sorts of things. So don't consider too much the metal um, to a certain extent. I mean the cheapest, cheapest. Sunday market tools are probably not the best ones for you, um, but carbon steel, old carbon steel is really, really good. High speed steel is fantastic. PM is good. Crow tree is good. Absolutely fine. No problem. I don't have any problems with any of them. There we are. So there's my drum sand. The <coughs> lathe is another tool, another workshop machine now. Can you see that there, Finn? All I need to do, I'm not going to do too much because of the dust extraction, but now you've got a nice little drum sander that you can get into all those little holes. All those little concave curves. Even if I wanted to do something like this, this is quite a fine curve. So all I would do is go down to the smaller drum. Okay, and you can see that that quite neat, quite neatly fits into that. All right, so they're a great little asset to have. This coupled up with your sanding disc on the lathe. You've got, like I say, you've got another couple of machines, really, if you think about it. I think mean, great little tools. I do support the ends, um, though, with the tail sock. I find that quite important, and it just helps to stop any wear um, on the shaft here. So hopefully, Lily, you've got, the, um, got those part numbers there. We'll move on. So that would be how to make the arch. Like I say, it's a non-wood turner. It's very, very quick. Um, using the bandsaw and using those drum sanders to achieve the shape that you're after. Okay. Um, we've just got a question from Melissa. Uh, she was just saying when she's finishing off the end of a bottle stopper, the arbor, am I pronounced that right? The arbor yeah. tends to loosen in the headstock. Um, okay. yes. Any? That's a very, very common one, that one. So the, the way I do it, because I've had it happen to myself as well, so you literally... Use the tail stock and part down. So do most of your sanding with, I don't know, two or three or an eighth of an inch still um, in place. Um, and then turn right the way down until that just, the, the um, tail stock just stops turning. And then you can take it away um, and just do your last tiniest little bit of, of, um, of tooling. But you literally, it won't allow you to do too much. So even if it's the point of doing some rough sanding, um, to take away the, the, the rest of the waste, do that. But you should just get away with it. It just won't allow you to do too much turning because if you think about it, what you're doing is levering that, um, that center away from the, um, from the headstock. So yeah, you just get a little bit um, less work on it really. I hope that's, uh, that was clear, Melissa. So center pin now. I think what I was doing for a minute then. So we're doing the hub. Probably the most complex part of the whole thing. We've got to create equally spaced holes around this hub so that the hub holders and eventually the blades can then locate into that um, and turn. We mustn't have an uneven hub, otherwise you're not going to have any rotation 
um, to your impellers. So look, what I'm doing to start with, I'm just gonna, this is a piece of ash by the way, we're just gonna support that between two centers. At the moment, single pointed and pro. The pro will come out once I've done most of the roughing down and, and finish the drilling. I'm not gonna do all the drilling for you, it'll take too long. Um, but I'm gonna do three or four holes get you an understanding of where we are with it. Just a quick question from Clive. He was just saying, uh, what was the website to get the initial dimensions? Where can you get the initial dimensions? Pen and paper. <laughs> <laughs> Pen and paper, guys. Um, I'm going to give you everything. I don't have these written down. I sell the plans on my own website, commonway.com, um, along with lots of other Christmas tree decorations or Christmas decorations. We haven't got this big complex one. However, if you want to go to the wood turning magazine this month, it's the first of a two password for three tiers um, Christmas pyramid. The plans are all written out there. And just another quick one from Len. He was just saying, what speed were you sanding at? Sanding at the same speed. It was around about 2,000 revs. And Charles was just asking, um, do the accessories on your website include uh, the long drill bits? No. No, sorry, they are, I work for a tool company. I'd be sacked if I started selling tools. <laughs> um, so, no, if you need to go to Axminster Tools. We do a series of long series drill bits. If you want longer than that, then online. Um, the, the longest ones that I've got here, well, the ones you saw me use on Tuesday, these, um, this is this particular one I did get from uh, did, did get online. So search online, um, long series drill bits online, and, and you'll get some. Yes. Yeah. No. Um, no. I value my position at Axminster. I've been there too long to jeopardise it now. <laughs> right. Let's just rough down. Just do a nice round cylinder. Pencil mark. This is going to be where I'm drilling, and now I can shape two inches or 50 mil. This square was. Don't worry, you know, this is too big at the moment. We will take a lot of that material away later. I just want that drill bit there because it's nice and strong and powerful, just so it can, um, just so it firms up the pieces I'm drilling it. There we are, that's okay. Right, I'm going to leave that just for the moment. We're now going to take this away. I've made a little homemade drill attachment, or not drill attachment, a hole, a drilling, um, they call that just a drilling attachment, I guess. It's just a piece of tim uh, oak um, with the right size drill hole in it for what I want to place here, it's five mil. So I've turned this down to fit nicely into the, the banjo of the lathe, um, then put it in my V block on the lathe and drill a nice um, 90 degree hole there, in this case, five mil. That's now going to go in my tool rest. Going to get the five mil drill bit and we're going to center it up. So that's going to pop through. Now I can get away with taking, at this stage, I can get away with taking the piece of turning out. We're going to put it straight back in, but to get center, let's bring this up, raise. There we are, we're on center point. And then I can lock my drill guide in place, put the piece of timber back. I'm 35 minutes in, will we? Lovely. There we are. Now, indexing. Indexing on this machine, I've got 36 positions. 36 indexing holes. 
you won't see them because they're actually inside the lathe. They're on my pulleys on the inside of the lathe. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to start my first hole. I want actually 12 positions on my hub. Um, I need 12 positions. I want 12 impellers and they have to be spaced out nice and equally. So if I start at zero, I'll then go every every three and make a drill. Make a drill and drill a hole. So we'll do our first one. And if you're going to do this at home, I would recommend you go around the whole of the circumference, scribing a line first, and then retrace your footsteps, actually drilling the hole. Because if you make a mistake when you're drilling, you can't repair it. If you do it when you're putting the line there, obviously you can. So that's my first hole. I'm going to move on three places. That's my three places. We're going to drill another hole. Another three places. There it is. Double check. Gone one place too too many look. So come back. Double check. That's in. Another three places. Last hole just for this demonstration. One, two, three. That's four holes. Let's turn it around and show you where we are. So you can see how equally spaced the, those holes are. So we're finished. You can finish those. So another eight of those to do, you've got your 12 holes. So that's relatively easy. Once you've done that, once you've done all 12 holes, then you can take out your pro drive. Uh, just a quick one from Don. Don was just saying um, he's got a craft lathe uh, with variable speed and he can change the belt to a lower setting. He was just wondering when and why you would need to do this. Think of your gears on your car. You could drive around town all day in first gear. You do your engine no good. Okay, if you're trying to get to speed, you'll be screaming the engine. So if you want to go really, really fast, you change those gears, those pulley settings up. Um, to a, a higher range. But imagine if you're, say you're going along in your car, you're in, in fourth or fifth gear, and you try and pull away. The engine just simply doesn't have the power to do it. So you need to drop down to first gear. So that's, you would liken that to turning a big piece, a big bowl, um, when you're on your high pulley settings, you're draining, you're making that, that motor struggle massively. So your pulley settings, like gears, use them that way. Um, just quickly before we move on, can we show um, what you're doing with the indexing pin. Yeah, well, you, yes, you can't really see much. Well, let me just grab the cable there, you know. Right, a bit shaky a minute, guys. Let me come around here. Oh. Right, so my indexing pin is right here. Okay, that screws in, and it's a little tapered pin. It locates into a hole in the pulley inside the casting. I've got corresponding numbers on my hand wheel here, so I'm looking at those, I'm locating those um, to get to the right position. It, this literally screws into the holes. It's a little tapered hole, like I say, and that accurately gives me my measurements. I've got 36 positions on this lathe, like I said, and so just um, skipping every three... Um, the holes gives me my 12 positions. Right, let's just tidy that piece up now so we can take away the big 
fits in from the top. And I'm going to tidy up the bottom. The bottom, that doesn't sort of fit flush onto anything. That's just suspended above the pin. So that can be slightly tapered. Here, however, we've got a little finial to go on top of there. So that needs to be flush or slightly dished. There we are. And again, give that a good sanding and you're done. That would be your, your centre hub made. Nice and easy. I told you this is going to be an easy project. Right, so now we need to make a, a piece that's going to hold the impellers. So let's have a look at a finished impeller there. So the bit we need to make next is this piece. And you notice we've got a little slot in it. So if I grab the piece of timber that we start with, and I've made that slot by using the fence of my bandsaw, I've ripped one side, turned it over, and then rip the other. You do that on a scrap piece, um, adjust your tool rest until you've got the right, um, uh, you know, the right distance to get the right thickness of slot for the blades that you can machine. And I machine all of my blades from long strips that are all in one piece originally, they go for the thicknesser, and my thicknesser will go down to three mil. If you don't have a thicknesser, you might know one that's, or someone that does. If you don't, then again, you'd have to go online. You can get two and three mil birch ply uh, fairly readily online. Um, that would be your next option. Um, how deep were the drill holes on the centerpiece? So they really can be as, as, as deep or as shallow as you want them to be, but they were around about five mil, five to six mil. That would be ample. And um, do you sell the pyramid cup bearings on your site? I do have the cup bearings. What you would need to do, so um, you'd go to the um, the website, just email me from that, contact me from there. They're not directly sold from the website. To email me how many you want. They're £3.50. Um, email me and I'll um, get the postage sorted and um, give you a reply as to how much the grand total is and we'll do the deal. Uh, and Dave was just saying, can you tell, can you say what angle is on the skew chisels? Because he has a, um, a crown premier range. If you go around about 25 degrees on the ground angle, that would give you, if you're a beginner, of course. Now that is a sort of a halfway house. If you want to, if you if you can use the skew well, then you can bring that angle all the way back to sort of 15 degrees if you want to. Um, that'll give you a much sharper cutting tool, but it's it's an aggressive one. It won't suffer falls at all. It'll um, it will definitely tell you if it doesn't like a cut. doing we're skewing down tidying up this face Kevin's asked me to ask you um, why is a banjo called a banjo do you know I don't know I've often thought of that question myself when I'm teaching we go through the anatomy of the lathe and um, I've never I've never even gone to look it up but if banjo or saddle is the other name I don't know anybody out there who's got access to Google have a look or any other search engine, of course. Um, so what I want to do now is, gonna, because we need to make 12, I want to have some sort of template so I know where all the marks are, just a little bit of paper. Now we're going to cut the tenon first. Very tiny little tenon, this is. Got to go into that five mil hole that you've made. 45 minutes in. Tiny little tenon, let's go. Feeding passing tool. Uh, just a quick one from Ricky. He said it's a little off subject, uh, that's fine. He just said, where can you get the quick release connectors for your airbrushes? Axminster Tools. Mm -hmm. Literally that, airbrush. Um, Lily, maybe you could put the link up. Um, so quick release airbrush fittings. They're sold in, um, I think you get four or five male fittings with a single 
uh, female. So obviously the female one go on the um, the air, air hose, and then all the males to air brushes. There we go, guys. Now look what we've got. We've got that that impeller holder with its slot in there neatly. I overthought that to begin with uh, when I first started making these and thought about how I can cut a slot in a round piece. Of course you don't, you do it before you turn. We're now part that one off using the skew. Just quickly about the um, wood turning magazine. Jenny was just asking how reader friendly is it for someone uh, or a newbie who isn't familiar with the technical terms of wood turning, obviously. Yeah, just, just quickly look at that one a minute. That's before we move on. And then you would turn that piece of timber over because it's double sided. Do your other one so you get two from one piece. That will then allow you to hold your your blades neatly and, and uh, you can rotate them to suit suit you. We can look at the blades next. So Jenny, yes. Um, so uh, like my demonstrations, the you know I. I'll give a, I'm one of probably about 15 um, contributors to the magazine. So uh, like my demonstrations, I talk as if I'm talking to a complete beginner. It's the same way as I write. Every contributor is slightly different, um, but you'll find certainly all of mine are aimed at the beginner. Um, so I don't think you'll have a problem whatsoever. And also the way it's written um, and supported by photos is done as a step-by-step -step guide. Um, so you should find that fairly straightforward. I would have thought, I would have thought. That's certainly the way I'm thinking when I'm writing. Right, so Finn, I think we can come back up just for the minute. We're gonna go back to our sanding table because we're gonna look at the impellers. Let's go with the coarse one. I'm gonna make an impeller. But we're going to have the dust extraction running because so I'm going to sand it to shape. And I'm going to tell you why. Um, because that timber is fairly, when it comes out of the plane of thickness, sir, it's out at three mil. If I can get two and a half, even better. So that means it's really thin. If you then go and try and cut that on the bandsaw, the likelihood is it's going to explode, sh shatter. S um, a scroll saw, fantastic. Hand coping saw again, fine. Or sand, or we'll do what I'm about to do, sand it to shape. So if I grab a piece of timber, I'll grab a template. Again, we want to make these all the same. So cardboard template, once you've done one, it's there for good. And let's just do a quick, quick scribe. So we're just going to do one of those. Dust extraction is going to go on nice and close with, with that. so thin, it doesn't take very long at all. Could you just give the, um, the length and the width of the propeller? Yeah, yeah, no worries. Blank. I've got a finish size here of about about four and three eighths. So we're looking at about 100 and, oh, 112 mil, and then 50. 
uh, wide, so two inches wide. And then we want to feather the edges, so... nicely feathered edge, so like a rolled edge almost. There, so I think we've got one more job to do. How much time? We've got plenty. We're 52 minutes in. 52, right, I'm going to make a very, very quick finial because we're going to cap it off with something. Don't worry, um, guys, if you're still scratching your head thinking, I didn't really understand that, keep asking questions. Lily's there. Um, she puts all of these questions together. Tomorrow I answer them. I go onto a big um, a shared file and answer all the questions that you've asked that we didn't get to today. So just keep asking questions. It's not a problem. I understand that this is... This, this, you know, these bigger ones are, are fairly complex. There's a lot to take in. Let's go for a piece of scrap wood. In fact, let's use instead of making another holder with that piece of oak, let's use that one. We only need a small finial because um, it's only going to fit onto. I say only. I'm going to bring this to you. And they've got to fit on top of here, so it doesn't have to be huge. There we are, let's go. We'll start off with this bowl gouge, nice and quick. I don't really have any shape in my head at all at the moment, so um, bear with me. Um, <clears throat> Ian was just asking where the file is, all the questions. Am I right in saying they put it on here and then get yeah, out? Just yeah. ask them on here, Lydia take care of, <clears throat> of them and get them to me for tomorrow. Right, just a little touch with the spindle. Right, 
We're going to run the lathe just to get him spinning because I've got a little bit of air coming from the fans on the lathe. Vinyl can be glued on top. Imagine that as your hot air from your candles coming up and your little seam rotating. One thing we haven't mentioned, Lily has the part numbers for the silver steel, the three mil centre pins. And you're going to measure that off against the, the hub, cut them off with a hacksaw on the lathe, all file it off, um, and a very sharp point then is needed on the end that hits the bearing. We'll show you that. I just thought you'd like to see that rotating. Um, it doesn't take much, and that was just literally the, f the, the wind from the fans of the lathe. But let's just have a look at that centre pin. Can you just very quickly give the size of the top round blade, the blade holder, um, and the whole size, and the small blade holder as well? The whole size was 5mm that's going into the hub. The blade, let me just measure again, but I just want to show you the centre pin. So it's basically a needle. If you imagine, someone described it last night as a knitting needle. Even sharper than that though. And I've just ground that on the bench grinder. Just twisted that pin as I was sharpening it. Glasses on, of course. Um, so yeah, what size? We were looking at five mil for the drillings in the, five mil for the drillings in the hub. The blades themselves. were 100, roughly 113, 114 long by 50 mil wide, three, two and a half to three mil thickness as well. Um, and uh, starting off, material size for the blade holders was 16 mil square by 112 mil, uh, sorry, 107 mil long. You can vary them though, you know, these can be whatever length you want them to be, too long and you won't get enough lift from the hot air, it'll dissipate too quickly, too short and become a danger. So work with danger um, on, in conversation, let's just say, talk about this, don't leave these unattended. If for whatever reason they stop, you've got hot air, hot flame above very thin timber and it will burn. Will burn. So they must never be left um, unattended in a room. Make sure they're spinning at all times. But I hope you've enjoyed that, guys. Finn, have you got any more questions before we finish? We're almost mm, out of time. No. Any questions, keep them coming, though, guys. Lily will sort them out for you. Guys, have a wonderful weekend. Get making. Send in the pictures. We've got some cracking pictures coming in. And, and see you on Tuesday, where we're going to be doing the Angels and the Miners of Light on uh, Tuesday and Thursday. So have a great weekend. See you again. Bye-bye.